G'day guys, Kelvin, Catching Company in New Zealand. We're doing clutch repairs, clutch hydraulic repairs. Jamie's truck is back. Last time we saw Jamie's, he'd been to four other places and he brought it to us and we tightened up the igniter bracket. And it's been running faultless. We did mention that there was an issue with the clutch. One, it wasn't set up correctly and two, the release bearing was making quite a bit of noise. Let's have a look at what's happened. It's, it's had a failure. So Jamie's an arborist, and I said to, to find the clutch master, which he did, and have a look inside. And um, there, was, there was no fluid in it. Now the fluid had fallen out. I got him to come in here, and there's noticeable fluid coming down the firewall on the inside, causing a bit of an issue. I have connected the, the, the pin already because I'm starting to pull this apart. So the clutch master has failed. So we're going to slip this bigger one in and set that up. The other issue we have is under here at the slave. The slave is now pushed all the way up hard onto the fork. I should be able to push that, that fork back into that slave. There's an extra bracket there that's been made and they had probably trouble with that exhaust manifold coming in too close. So that's a, a bit of a stuff up. I don't have an exact solution for that at this point, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the master in it, get it bled. Like that, it's pushed hard back. Absolutely hard back. And come up with a bit of a plan. I don't have a slave in stock. But I've ordered, um, I've ordered one of those. So let's get into it, see what I can do. So here we have the clutch master off. You can see quite clearly it's had a big leak up. And this is the replacement. We're going from a 5 8 bore size to a 3 quarter. That's going to give it more travel at the bottom and generally solves a lot of clutch problems by doing this. I'm going to do a little bit of an adjustment in this department here on the push rod length. I'm going to go do some measurements and change that fitting over and then I'm going to refit this one. Before I do though I'm going to bleed that up on the bench to make it easier once it goes in the hole. Right, oh, I've uh, swapped this over. I've given, given the push rod a bit of a trim so that the push rod doesn't foul upon the clutch lever, because that's, or the pedal, because that's really bad when that happens. And you'll notice it's got fluid on it. So I've filled it up with fluid and actually physically bled it, pumped it in and out, and put a cap over it. So now when I fit it, it's, it's ready to go. With a lot of conversions, identifying parts can be a bit tricky. Fortunately, I have my parts man. I might have helped him out with his car at a very reasonable price. So he, uh, I just message him, send him some photos. He finds the parts. It's just awesome. And, it, and it's really good to have those relationships. Looks like it's getting an LN130 Surf clutch uh, slave cylinder. It's getting couriered out to Jason tonight. Hopefully we'll have that here tomorrow to ready to put on. I'm going to put this uh, master on. The master's the main issue in this case. The reason I'm doing the slave is it's had the same crack that's been through this master go down the lines to the slave. So it kind of it reduces the chances of failures going forward. And that's important to me. Make sure you lube your pin. It's very important. On this one, because it was a bit tight down in here and the, it's got a small hole through the firewall, I actually have assembled it. And I will have pushed it through the hole and then put the booty on. And then I've put push rod and the pin on. There's also a spring up in here somewhere. I took a spring off anyway. There it is.
while I'm tightening my nuts, I've got a bit of fluid going through it. So I've got the, the bleeder on the slave undone. And it's just weeping out. It's fairly tight in here. We lock this up. Okay, the sun's starting to come out, which, which is actually really nice. And you see there, I've just got a little bit tight. So I'm just the free plate. So I wind the rod until there's actually no pressure, so it just flops around. It's hard to tell a little bit with the spring on, so if I take the spring off again, which was a pain to get on, you can actually see there, it's, it's just floating, it's not doing anything, it's not pushing on the piston, that's nice. Make sure we lock up the uh, lock nut. We've got lots of funny angles going on today, haven't we? That's nice. I'll put that spring back on, which is which is a two-handed job, so we'll put you down. Alright, we've adjusted it. Let's see if we've got a pedal. With the bigger master, it is very, very firm. So we've got good travel. I think that's gonna work. Beauty. And that release bearing isn't too bad at the moment. Nice clutch again. steers there last yesterday decided uh, they might move themselves and they, they chose that paddock they're looking quite tasty and there's our heifer oh. yeah we got that one by mistake it's meant to be a steer so that's our steaks next time you look yummy Jamie's not sure what to do with this truck. He really, really likes them. And as with a lot of conversions, there's some stuff that he's, he's brought someone else's problem. Generally what I see is when guys get a, a really cool truck, and that's done properly, they keep it. And they keep it for a long, long time. But the ones that get sold often aren't quite up to spec. This one needs a bit of work, needs a clutch sorted, a few bits of other bits and pieces around it. There's a little bit of rust, which can be expected because it's an early one. <laughs> yeah, at least big marks really quick. <laughs> Hmm. 
two-wheel drive lights on. Hubs aren't clicked in, are they? I just drove here in two-wheel drive. Yep, yeah, I drove here in two-wheel drive. That's why it lit up the back wheels. So as I was saying, this is a, a really, really cool truck. It's the early one. So it's an 86. And all around, generally, it's, it's a pretty cool truck. You've got the big winch. You've got the bull bars on it. You've got the flat deck for when he's working. He moves uh, trees, he cuts trees down. This truck does absolutely everything that, that the owner wants it to do. Works for his business, tow stuff, tows big loads, all that stuff works for him. So there's a few niggles and it's gonna cost money to sort, like the clutch and stuff. I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on the slave cylinder because if I do a clutch on it, I'm putting an internal release bearing on it. Solves all those problems and the master cylinder is designed to work with that and it's already adjusted. I've got no problem running um, new fluid through it because it flushes that system out even if it gets another slave on it I'm fine with that because then that new slave cylinder isn't trying to digest the old crap through the lines anyway the clutch is working it's doing what it should I'm gonna wait for a slave cylinder tomorrow we might do a bit of an update not sure yet we'll see how we get on but hey, it's back, it's driving, clutch feels pretty good. A bit stiffer than it was because of the bigger master. But I'm happy. I'm going to do a bit of a test of the clutch. It's one I don't like to do too much, but it's a good indicator. Handbrake on. Third gear. Let the clutch out. The result is it should stall. If it stalls, it's an indication that the clutch has got a bit of bite to it. I've had plenty where I've done that and you just sit there revving it, foot off the clutch, clutch is slipping. And that's an indicator that the clutch is stuffed. It's a good test to have. Use it gently or use it wisely. I'm under another vehicle and we're going to show you some slave cylinder alignment. Because this one's got a little bit of a problem. Hopefully we can see in here okay. We can see here, here's, here's the external slave. And you see this push rod's on a, on a big angle coming out to the, the fork. So ideally this would be spaced out, spaced out, um, would be, have a spacer behind it to move it out a little bit. But in this case, there's these extractors in the way, this exhaust, causing problems. So that push rod's on a, on a funny angle. And that can cause problems. That, that ball's not looking the best either because there's, there's no booty on it. And you can see it's upside down. That is not unusual when we're doing these sort of conversions to mount that upside down. Of course, you, you couldn't get at the bleeder if it was at the top because of these extractors. Um, I found that bung I was looking for. Yeah, it was on top of the slave cylinder. So when you're trying to set up Oh, no. When you're trying, there is no try. There is only do. When you're setting up your slave, if you're using externals, make sure you get your angle of your rod correct. It's squeaky. It, it doesn't help that that slave is so close to the exhaust, it's just going to cook the fluid. Yeah. Good reason to put an internal in it, so you've got room for exhausts. So Jason is making some modifications on this one. Maybe. Well, you are making modifications. Whether they're successful is the question. So this happens to actually have an adapter plate in it. We'll have a look under here. So we've got a factory UZ bell housing and then this adapter plate here, the steel adapter plate or sandwich plate between the bell housing and the gearbox. As such, they've built up this little brackety thing to mount the slave cylinder on. And it's all very, very close in here to other things. You see that sits in there and then the bolt goes through it. 
Yeah. You having trouble getting in the hole? You're, you're, you want some guidance? You're, you're, wait, wait. you need to go up. I sometimes need guidance too. It's okay. Yeah? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, yeah. Does it feel good? It sounded good. So the goal is to get it so this will actually push back in like he's got it. How much did you slot those holes, Jens? Some. Some. You can see how much I've moved it. You can see there. Yeah, you can see there you've moved it um, three mils. I reckon you can go a little bit more, eh? Measure up in here before you hit exhaust and, and halve that distance, and I reckon you're going to get it pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. You've done well. I wasn't sure you were going to get enough, eh? Probably pick some oil leaks too. We've got some oil leaks coming down the back of that cylinder head out of that rear blanking bung, which is impossible to change in the vehicle. Oh, take tap cover off. If we fix this, if it gets a clutch, it's getting an internal one. So this is a temporary to get us, keep us going. You've done very well just to give it some clearance. Well, how about we fucking bleed it first, eh? I'm gonna just uh, get a bit of a check here. Oh, you've got, at least you've got some there, that's nice. What will happen is the clutch wears. The fingers will move out and the fork will move in, okay? And that will use up this free play. I know the bearing, the release bearing on this is noisy. So at some point, it's going to come apart. It's going to get an internal release bearing to solve this problem completely. So this is a temporary, but we still want to make it reasonably reliable. So... So a little bit of this on the release bearing, we're going to cross our fingers, but we've got some free play there, which is really good. Jace wants me to bleed it. Do you want me to bleed it? Let it on. When you pumped it lots, that whole bracket was moving. It was like the self, self putting in free play. Yeah. That's cool. There's a bit of a squeak there. Just um, start it up and see how the release bearing sounds now. I'll just have to. I, I don't think I'll bother. What? Well, it keeps going up. I can't even see anything now. Oh, Early Lexus. Normal sort of setup. Yes, we know the clutch reservoir lid's on there because we were just bleeding the clutch. So this is an 86 leaf sprung. It's got the big wheels, got good shocks. We'll have a bit of a look underneath in a moment. <coughs> what have we got under here? Looks like they've made a new cross member. So it doesn't sit so low. Because these ones normally sit real low. It's got the electronic engagement gearbox. Oh, no. Nah. It doesn't have the small box. Jason's had the big box put in it. It's got, a, it's got an R-series box with an with a adapter on it. Hence why it's got that electronic engagement. No drive shaft hoops. So that technically isn't actually legal for us. Exhaust. Twin pipes to back by the fuel tank. It still has <laughs> that exhaust that fell off. He still hasn't put it back on. <laughs> but that's still legal. And adjustable shocks at the back. It's very cool, it's got the big box. I'm, I'm assuming, well, no, I'm not assuming. The, the noise in here could be release bearing, or it could be the gearbox. Okay, and the front, we've got the, a bit leaky, but it's got a front sump in it. Or oh, it could do with a new plug here. We won't, we won't touch it. It's actually, I would say that's actually been glued on. Remote oil filter. Um, I normally use a, like a saw or a one that moves forward. So it's got the re remote filter out here, which is a little bit susceptible to wheels. Winch, and a fan switch down here. 
alternator that's dripping oil, which isn't a good sign. And they don't last too good covered in oil. And this fella here, I normally move them down further to clear the sump. Oh, actually the radiator is a Hilux version, but it's an alloy one, alloy version of a Hilux. Strange, it's got these cast iron manifolds on it. Actually the later VVTi, or actually off a high ace van had them as well. Pretty cool. So it's got the farmer's flat deck on it, which per works perfectly for an arborist. 15 inch wheels with 33 by 12.5s. And a fuel filter was under the, was the fuel filter under the bonnet? I see quite a few conversions that don't have a fuel filter in them, which is kind of a stuff up. Fuel pump is not in the tank. Uh, we've got a little facet lift pump. And then we've got another pump set it over here with an ugly fuel filter there in the off the bottom of the surge tank. So someone spent a bit of time sorting that out. I don't really like it. I prefer to put the pumps directly into the fuel tanks. But at least it's got a surge tank because these pumps, these external pumps, are not designed to suck. Someone's done quite a nice job. Could do with some new diff seals. Uh, both sides, not too bad. All right. Maybe use to do with a hook for the winch too. It's a fairly solid bull bar, isn't it? Isn't it? Big. Solid bull bar. All right, very cool. Let's get it on the ground. Let's go for a drive. There's a fuel filter. Ready to cap. Much nicer with the proper seal on it. Not the worn out seal. We might, might pop some oil in, eh? It's on the... L. Oh, it's a good idea. There's not oil, it's just the outside of it. There's the oil's <laughs> Yeah, we want to keep the oil on the inside. Put some oil on it. No, it's a cool truck. Fine. Fine, Jason. What did we learn about four-wheel drive before you get out of the paddock? Leave it in four-wheel drive. Leave it in four-wheel drive. I, I went down the other day to the paddock. I didn't realise it was in two-wheel drive. I went to drive out of the paddock, and, and I didn't. I actually got stuck in a four-wheel drive. So I had to hop out, put it into the hub. Hubs in. You have to check the hubs. You, hubs are in? Hubs are out now. Hubs are out now. Go again. Jason experienced the same thing. But has the clutch? It's okay. It's good. Good enough. Good. We, we are hoping to put a clutch on it. He's actually, but get a warrant, get rust fixed, then we'll do a clutch. And I don't have time because we've got clutches to do on other cars. Yeah. Cool. Yeah.